Counting the Stars, the story of Katherine Johnson, NASA mathematician, Lisa Klein Ransom, illustrated by Raoul Colon. Katherine Johnson was born the fourth child of Joshua and Joylette Coleman and the first to love numbers. By the time Katherine could speak, she was counting. She even counted the steps she walked from her front porch to Sunday morning church service. At night, after her mama and daddy tucked her into bed and the moon shone bright in the West Virginia sky, Catherine counted the stars, one by one. She was too young to go to school, so Catherine followed behind her sister and brothers to the two-room schoolhouse in White Sulphur Springs. When the teacher noticed the tiny curly-haired girl reading along with other students, she offered Catherine her own seat. Her mother was a teacher, but it was her father, a lumberman and farmer, who could figure numbers in his head faster than anyone Catherine knew. Why? What? How? Her father helped her find the answers to her math questions when her teachers couldn't. At six years old, instead of starting her first day in kindergarten, Catherine went straight to second grade. Instead of starting third grade, Catherine went to fifth. During the school year, Joshua and Joylette left behind their farm and rented a home 125 miles away in Institute, West Virginia, and enrolled all four Coleman children in school at West Virginia Institute. Joshua traveled back and forth, working as a bellman to make ends meet. The Coleman sacrifice paid off, and by the time Catherine was 10, she started her first year of high school in Institute. When Catherine wasn't outdoors with her friends or exploring her own backyard, she spent her time alone indoors where the world she explored existed only in her own imagination. In the early evenings, Catherine's principal walked his youngest student home, stopping to point out the constellations overhead. Ever since she had counted stars outside her bedroom window at night, Catherine's mind swirled with questions that soared past the clouds and far beyond her. In 1933, with high school ending and the Great Depression beginning, Catherine wondered if she could find more answers in college. But with times tough all over, college seemed as far away as the moon. However, West Virginia State Institute found promise in the 15-year-old with a gift for numbers and offered her a full scholarship. She entered the college's math department. As she walked across campus, numbers would march in Catherine's head. Calculus, algebra, trigonometry, probability classes, Catherine took them all. When her college ran out of classes for Catherine to take, her math professor, William Clater, created an analytic geometry course just for her. All alone, she sat in a classroom with empty seats behind her, chalkboards filled with mathematical proofs and formulas in front of her. You would make a good research mathematician, Professor Clater told her. Catherine knew a lot of girls in the segregated South who were teachers, mothers, and nurses, but she had never met one who was a mathematician. But where will I find a job, Catherine asked. Professor Clater continued scribbling numbers on the board and said, That will be your problem. When college ended, teaching began for Catherine at a high school in West Virginia where she was nearly as young as her students. Outside of the classroom, Catherine found love in the brown eyes and big heart of Jimmy Goebel. She loved teaching as much as she loved Jimmy, but in 1940s West Virginia, married women weren't allowed in the classroom, so quickly and quietly, the two became one. They both now taught at a high school in Jimmy's ho hometown of Marion, Virginia. First one, then two, then three daughters were born. Two teacher salaries plus two summer jobs barely equaled the roof over their heads. And with three little girls to care for, Catherine and Jimmy knew the numbers weren't adding up. Jimmy's sister and brother-in-law told them of the opportunities in Hampton, Virginia, where there were plenty of shipyard jobs waiting for Jimmy and even a government job for Catherine. It wasn't teaching, but over at the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics at Langley Aeronautics, Word was they were looking for women who were good with numbers for their computing department. Let's do it, Catherine decided. She didn't know much about flight, but Catherine knew an awful lot about math. Dorothy Vaughn, a 10-year veteran at Langley, greeted Catherine on her first day as a human computer. In the aircraft 
loads building at Langley Aeronautics, the West Computing Office was filled with brown faces of women furiously completing data sheets of equations. Dorothy knew Catherine's family back in White Sulphur Springs, and she knew Catherine's reputation with numbers. Nearly 20 years earlier, when the computing pool began, many of the engineers wondered aloud how the female mind could possibly process concepts as complicated as math. But it was the job of these women's computers to double-check the engineers' data, develop complex equations, and analyze the numbers. Each desk had a calculating machine, but many of the women didn't need them. Catherine had barely settled into the routine at Langley when Dorothy called her and a co-worker over to her desk. The flight research division is requesting two new computers, Dorothy told them. I'm sending you two. It was just a temporary assignment, she told them, two weeks at the most. Catherine grabbed her purse and hurried over to building 1244, curious to see what the engineers were up to. Outside the research division building, a runway was humming with aircraft. Inside, the office hummed with energy. Catherine found a seat and got to work. Now Catherine sat at the table in the meetings, the only woman, the only computer, the only brown face taking notes as engineers discussed new discoveries and machine computers that worked 15 times faster than humans. Catherine listened even closer when they began discussing a brand new field, space. On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth. Sputnik may have beaten the United States into outer space, but the race was far from over. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics changed its focus from airplanes when it became the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. The race to space was in full swing. The long hours Catherine's team worked grew longer as the U.S. hurried to find an answer to the Soviet Union's Sputnik. They found it just a few months later when they launched the Explorer 1 satellite. The more space discoveries there were, the more the world wanted to know. The bleeps and signals from the satellites orbiting Earth, transmitted to radios and homes across the country, made people wonder how much more was beyond Earth's atmosphere. Was there life on other planets? Could man travel into space? NASA set out to answer those questions with Project Mercury named for the Roman god of travel. The Mercury, a six-foot-wide spacecraft, would carry the first man into Earth's orbit. They just needed to figure out how. Engineers ran over one million experiments, test runs, simulations, and inspections, and still in 1961, the Russians again beat the United States when their first human shot into space orbited Earth. The U.S. grew tired of waiting. Why weren't we winning the space race? The folks at NASA had the best minds, the skills, expensive computers. They had Mercury 7, a group of experienced NASA-trained pilots. They even had a secret weapon, Katherine Johnson. It was the engineer's job to plot the path of the spacecraft from the moment it left the launch pad until the moment of its descent into the Atlantic Ocean. The Mercury Atlas rocket was thrust the 3,000-pound, 11-foot capsule up into the air with enough force to orbit the Earth. But the tricky part, they all knew, wasn't getting the astronaut launched. It was getting him back. Let me do it, Catherine told the head engineer. Tell me where you want the man to land, and I'll tell you where to send him up. Huddled at their desk, Catherine and the engineers came up with a few different equations for trajectories or possible outcomes to program into the computers. Knowing that one wrong number, one wrong decimal, could mean the difference between success and failure, life and death. With the stars glowing outside her window, Catherine spent her nights awake and her days at a chalkboard. Questions and numbers once again swirled in her head, but this time she was calculating distances, plotting trajectories, and noting the Earth's gravity and speed of rotation, making sure the flight was a success for NASA and the astronaut, John Glenn. With the flight crew, spacecraft, and launch team all ready to go, John Glenn was not. He needed one final check of the computer's calculations. He needed Catherine. Call her, he told the engineers. Get the girl to check the numbers. Catherine had one and a half days before launch to double-check the trajectory numbers that a mechanical computer had taken just hours to spit out. 
She worked each digit backward and forward. When finally her numbers and the computers were a perfect match, John Glenn was ready to go. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, blast off! On February 20th, 1962, Catherine watched the broadcast as the Mercury Atlas rocket boosted John Glenn into history as the first American to orbit Earth. Catherine counted as she watched the screen, three orbits, four hours, 55 minutes, and 23 seconds until finally, John Glenn and the capsule splashed down safely in the Atlantic Ocean. As the world cheered, Catherine wondered, why, what, how could she make numbers take on astronaut even farther, beyond Earth's atmosphere, and maybe even to the moon?